Thank you for, visit, uh, for visiting today's presentation, The Need for Financial Literacy, Reaching Students Where They Are. My name is Jan Smith. I am the Manager of Outreach Services for the Office of Student Financial Assistance, a division of Florida Department of Education. Also with me today is Lori Oxier, Director of Outreach Services. Together, Lori and I serve on a team of eight people who travel the state promoting financial well-being and college access for young adults. Our little team of eight visited 850 schools last year, conducted 870 workshops for a total of 129,000 people. Needless to say, we are tired, and I know you all are too. Today's presentation features statistics and resources available to help you provide financial literacy to adult education students. So let's get started with our topic. Again, we are the Office of Student Financial Assistance, a division of the Florida Department of Education. We administer the state grants and scholarships and provide support for our educational partners through a comprehensive financial counseling program called Navigating Your Financial Future. Did you know that most students have a disconnect with reality? I realize we're preaching to the choir, but one of the questions asked on the 2011 Charles Schwab Teens and Money Survey was, what do you expect to earn when you graduate from college? And, and what do you expect to earn once you've established yourself in your chosen career field? And students expect to earn $70,000. And once you're established, they expect to earn $150,000. That is your smile for today, because we know that our reality is so different from these expectations. I'm thinking maybe the TV reality shows like the Kardashians would be influencing some of this. I remember back in the day when I taught GED classes years ago, how many students wanted to become crime scene investigators because of one show, CSI. Indicate with the smiley face if you've had a similar experience with pop culture, whatever was going on in the TV world or pop culture world is definitely influencing what students wanted to be or do. So let's take a look now at what's really happening. The grim reality is long range planning is Friday. Just get me through this week. 39 million U.S. adults are unbanked or underbanked, and unbanked individuals are, the slang term for them is now walking ATMs, and they're often crime tar targets because they carry cash on them. So I think that's interesting that we already have a slang term for people who don't use banks. Also, I wanted to point out on our slides, we have listed um, the resources where we have gotten our statistics from because we would like for you to have access to those same reports and research that's out there, especially if you are applying for grants to promote financial literacy within your organization. These are very useful things. The one we've mentioned on this is called Profiting from Poverty, which is a very fascinating uh, research document. The grim reality, again, is that 43% of U.S. Latino Hispanic people are unbanked and paying up to 1000 to 2000 a year by using payday lenders. This is a disturbing new trend, the use of payday advance stores. Uh, Florida actually has a statute authorizing payday lending, but they did cap it at 390%, which I think is just still exorbitant. It's just awful. Um, but if you take what they're, the fees that they're paying on a 14-day $100 loan, when you um, compute that into an annual percentage rate, it's 390%. The statistic on the left side of the slide is very disturbing to me as well. Did you know there are more payday lenders in the U.S. than Starbucks or McDonald's? Notice, for example, where these offices are located, low-income neighborhoods, and they are crime targets, especially when people, people are watching um, clients leave the store knowing that they have cash. But let's think of another aspect of this. Where are these payday lender stores getting their cash to loan out at these interest rates? And believe it or not, the Profiting from Poverty um, research paper that we have indicated here as our source indicates that two of the largest funders behind them are Wells Fargo and Bank of America. Yes, the very banks that were bailed out from the subprime mortgage market and promised never to do that again, they have found a loophole. And this is our next issue, especially with a lot of our students. Can you show me a smiley face if you've heard your students uh, talk about this as an, as an option? They're using payday lenders or maybe even pawn shops to, um, or check cashing agencies to receive cash. 
this is just a vicious cycle that's hard for students to get out of. Also, Florida st statistics from the Florida Prosperity Partnership. This is a great group to be connected with. They do a lot of research and statistics on the well-being of Floridians. Right now, 52% of Floridians are in liquid asset poverty, meaning they're living paycheck to paycheck. Statistics also show that a homeowner can reduce their, their likelihood of experiencing foreclosure just by having $500 in savings. This emergency fund helps cushion financial uh, crises, and the statistics shows a direct correlation that fi just having $500 in savings causes a person to be eight times less likely to experience foreclosure. And also, with the student loan debt, um, Right now, through the Project Student Debt um, Research Center, they have listed Florida's average student loan debt is $25,250. And it, that is just the average. We come across students throughout our um, travels with much more debt than that. And it's very disturbing. And they're having a hard time managing that. So how can adult educators help? First of all, we would like to ask and I know you're trying to do this, but please try to infuse financial education into your existing curriculum. There's really no reason to purchase a curriculum specifically for this, but try to incorporate real life materials and scenarios. Look for those teachable moments when you can infuse uh, a financial topic into your lessons. Invite speakers from actual financial entities, such as banks. And always, always know that when you invest in this process, you are empowering your students to take control of their financial futures. Other important factors is uh, would be to have successful financial lessons would be to make learning fun. Above all, we know numbers and money. People are just petrified about talking about money or how to manage it. And sometimes it's such a dry topic, you, you can just see students' faces glaze over. But if we use current references that uh, would ring true with our students that maybe we can get their attention a little bit. Um, also, Ruby Payne, who wrote uh, several books about the culture of poverty, one in particular that I'm uh, very impressed with is Bridges Out of Poverty. Uh, she has written about the hidden rules of each social class. And I had not heard of this until I was teaching uh, GED classes in Pennsylvania and came across her uh, study and how different Social classes have different unspoken rules, and one may not, one group may not understand what the other group is expecting out of their life. For example, wealthy people think more globally because they tend to travel to other countries and are exposed to other cultures. That makes sense, right? Middle class people think in terms of education and saving for retirement, whereas people living in poverty. Think in survival mode, how to get through today. Do my, does my family have enough food, clothing, and shelter to get through the next 24 hours? So we want to be sensitive in, uh, to what class our students are coming from and what their mindset is. And we just can't assume that they understand our language or where we're coming from if we're from a different uh, income bracket. The other thing we would like to offer, we do have um, instances where we're going to uh, suggest resources to help uh, students learn with their different learning styles. So hopefully you can find something from the slides coming up that will help you uh, pinpoint some things that may work. It just to, You don't have to use them all, but just pick and choose what works for your specific audience. Common financial literacy components. First of all, we've got five different sections, and this is coming right from the Financial Literacy National Standards. We have cash flow and budgeting, the number one thing that students need to get a grasp on. Credit, how to maintain good credit, how to establish credit, how to repair bad credit, and debt management. And then we've got risk management which would be your insurance, are you protected, is your family protected, and then investing and retirement planning. The first three I've highlighted in green only because we have realized that if students can get a great foundation in those first three concepts, the other two topics will flow into place more easily for them. So I would, we would suggest focus on those first three topics heavily just to make sure they have a very good foundation, and that will give them breathing room to focus on the last two topics. Navigating your financial future, 
also has uh, topics. And again, this is the website that our office sponsors. We uh, offer it free to anyone who wants to use it. Um, so you can, uh, first of all, let's just look at the topics we offer. Financial literacy, managing your budget, managing your credit, repayment of your student loan debt, financial aid is very popular, school and life management, career planning, and more. Now these topics are available in different formats. Uh, first of all, for those of you who are in Florida, we are we can travel to you and present these workshops in person in the state of Florida. If you're outside of our state lines, we have audio presentations and online modules to help meet the need in your particular area. And let's don't forget about our students who are parents, whether they're parents of young children or teenagers. We need to understand that our parents may have issues in talking about money with their families, and they, their children need to learn financial literacy as well. A statistic from the survey of the state says that one third of parents are more comfortable talking with their kids about smoking, drugs, and bullying than about money. Think about this for a second and just post your feedback with a smiley face. Um, how many of you remember your parents sitting down and going over everything money related with you when you were growing up? Mine did not. Oh, some of you did. Good for you. <laughs> some of us were not so lucky. I think it's just the culture of parenting that we don't want, sometimes we don't want kids to know our business, or sometimes we're afraid our kids are going to call us out on what, how we're not managing our own money effectively. It's just an awkward conversation. If you want to help parents have an easier time of opening up the door to have a conversation, visit this website, awkwardconversations.org. It's a public service announcement that was created by another financial literacy group, and it's actually fabulous. It's a couple who sit down with their son saying, we want to have the talk, and it sounds like it's leading up to the talk, and, uh, but really it's about money. And so it's just an interesting um, public service announcement that may be useful in helping parents open the door to talk about money with their, their family. One activity that I think is fabulous, you can offer this to your students that are parents in your class, or even it's a great activity for an individual. This is the 52-week money challenge chart. I actually saw this on Pinterest and thought, this is wonderful. It, there's 52 weeks in a year, and whatever week you start on, this is week one. If we started today, we would save $1. Week two, we save two dollars. Let's fast forward to week 15, we're going to save 15 dollars and so forth until we make it to week 52 where we would save 52 dollars. By the end of 52 weeks, if we have followed this chart, we should have saved 1,378 dollars. This, I think, is a great visual for a lot of our students, especially if they have families who want to save up for something special like a TV or to go away for a, a mini vacation or something. They can put this on the refrigerator and as a family say, did we save our dollars this week? How many do we need? We need $16. We're in week 16. Did we meet our goal of saving $16? I think this is a fun, teachable moment that you can have with your students and for students who are parents to have with their children. And when making learning fun, please remember to use current references. Right now, Iron Man, if, you don't, if you're not sure who this is, this is Tony Stark as Iron Man. Um, and you know, the topic we would want to talk about is life insurance. But those of you who know this cartoon character, um, Tony Stark is a wealthy guy. He's not married. And the question would be in your class, does this guy need life insurance? And they would ask him why or why not. Have, go around and have them explain why they think he should, why they think he shouldn't. And truthfully, the reason we even have life insurance is to protect family members who are left behind and will be impacted by the loss of income. So think about it. He's wealthy, but he's not married. He doesn't have children, so he doesn't need life insurance per se, but he does need a will. I think we would all agree, with an estate that large, he needs a will because he's going to have a lot of people who are going to go after that money. The next cartoon character, when we talk about life insurance, is Homer Simpson. Does this guy need life insurance? Ask your students this. They will recognize him. Most of them will know that Homer is married. He has three children and works in a high-risk job at a nuclear power plant. So he needs life insurance for sure. So currently, I'm um, getting ready to turn over the session to Lori. I uh, just want to double check if we have any questions out there before we move on to the next half of our presentation. Is everybody hanging in there okay? Indicate with a smiley face. 
Thank you. You all are great. Okay, at this time, um, I will uh, turn this presentation over to Lori Oxier, the Director of Outreach Services, who will continue our Making Learning Fun section of the presentation. Thank you. Hi, this is Lori. Um, sorry about that. We had just a little bit of a glitch there with our audio. Um, <clears throat> I want to thank you all for joining us for today's webinar. And Jan, I want to thank you. You've given us some great information on why we need financial literacy. As Jan stated earlier, it's so important to make learning fun. She used this example in our team training recently, and it was interesting to see the different answers that our teammates Gabe, so think about it. If you took one penny and doubled the amount each day for 30 days, how much money would you have? If you'd like to share your answer with the group, please enter it in the chat box. I'll give everyone a second to think about it. Anybody want to take a guess? Okay. All right, well, I'll just give you the answer then. The answer is $5,368,000. Dollars and 12 cents. Yes, you are reading that correctly. Five million dollars. I know you are all getting out your calculator and starting to do the math to verify it. It's okay. I'm not offended. We did the same thing when Jan showed us this example. Now granted, the average person does not have the ability to save over five million dollars in 30 days. But it is a valuable lesson that even with starting with just one penny, you can build a savings account. If your students realize that they can start small, it will be easier for them to build an emergency savings account or even try and tackle that 52-week challenge. I encourage you to share this with your students just to see what examples or what answers and their reactions would be. So let's take a look at navigating your financial future and the different resources that we have available to appeal to all types of learning styles. Here's a screenshot of our current NYFF website. We are currently undergoing a website re revitalization, so plan to see a new look and feel soon. However, the resources will still stay the same. And we even have a few new things in the works, so stay tuned. If you look at the center of the screen, you will see a quick reference guide that evalu evaluating financial aid award letters. This is a scrolling text box that highlights pertinent information and appeals to your visual learners. In the lower left-hand corner, we have a link to our audio presentations for your auditory learners. This is the newest edition to our website and is undergoing a major transformation, so keep an eye out for updates. Lastly, in the lower right-hand corner, there's a link to our NYFF brochures. This is great for your visual learners, but it's also a place where you can check out each brochure to determine what you would like to order for your organization. By ordering these brochures via the partner login in the upper right-hand corner, you will have resources available that you need for your tactile learners. 
In addition to the brochures, we also have bookmarks and posters available for you to order at no charge. If you do not have a partner login, please contact Jan Smith at jan.smith at fldoe.org and she will create one on your behalf. Another great resource for your visual learners are our online workshops. If you click on the workshops tab on the NYFF homepage, you will be directed to the current online workshop options. Once your student selects the workshop option that they are interested in, they will be directed to select an institution from a drop-down box. Post-secondary institutions have a specific designation, but other users should direct their students to select OSFA University. Once the student has completed the online workshop, they can then print their certificate of completion. Jan and I are also working on adding a pre-test, post-test, and a post-survey option to each workshop so that we can utilize student feedback to enhance the student workshop experience. We also encourage you to review the workshops and provide your feedback as well. We value your input because we know that you can provide valuable information on how to effectively reach your student population. So what are, other, what are some of the other ways that you can provide information to your students? You can bring in guest speakers. For example, your local credit union may be willing to send over a representative to talk to your students about banking, saving, budgets, and more. Our OSA outreach representatives are also available to speak to your students within Florida locations, and we can present on any of the topics that we just saw in the online workshop modules. We can also bring a variety of our NYSF brochures to pass out to the audience. To review the PowerPoint presentations, you can use your partner login and download them. Prior to the workshop, let us know if you would like to <clears throat> if you would like for us to make any changes necessary to appeal to your specific student audience. We are more than happy to accommodate any changes necessary because we want the students to leave the workshop feeling satisfied that they have learned something new and have access to resources that they were not aware of before. Other options um, include utilizing our audio presentations, maybe even linking to iTunes University or even creating hyperlinks from your website to various podcasts that are available. Jane and I fondly refer to this as R&D, rip off and duplicate. <laughs> For your visual learners, we have already discussed some of these options, but you may want to research smartphone apps that are available and recommend them to your students. Or if you're really brave, create your own. Jan and I are taking our first baby steps toward creating our own NYFS smartphone app. At this point, we both feel like we know enough about the process to be dangerous, and I'm sure our IT department feels the same way. But it is, you know, we all know that's the way to reach our students. They always have their phone in their hand. So it's definitely a great option if you um, can get that done. Another creative resource for you to link to is PBS is Your Life, Your Money. This website has a compilation of resources that appeal to all types of learners. Jan and I like this op option because it incorporates the peer-to-peer -peer approach. Jan and I both have college students at home who roll their eyes when we talk to them about financial aid or financial literacy. My daughter has even questioned my financial aid knowledge even though I have been in the industry for 19 years. But let her hear the same thing from a friend and it's suddenly gospel. You all know you have students that are just like this. But on a serious note, friends listen to friends and the PBS approach works. Another way to build a rapport with your kinesthetic learners is to incorporate hands-on experiences into the lessons. For example, I was on the phone with a student earlier this week who stated, I think I have to take out a student loan. When I asked why, she said, well, I don't think I have enough money to cover my living expenses this term. After digging a little deeper, I realized that she did not know how much she was going to make per hour at her new job. She didn't know how many hours that she would be working, and she really didn't even know what her living expenses were going to be. So I was like, okay, let's get out a piece of paper, 
Let's get a pen. Let's start making a budget. Once we worked out all of the logistics and put it down on paper, she realized that she didn't need a student loan. But had we not taken the time to go through the steps to build a budget for her, she would have probably just borrowed the loan. Unfortunately, Jan and I see this every day. Students borrowing unnecessarily while in college, and then they're stuck in this huge struggle trying to repay a student loan they can't afford. I know this is a simple example, but our students really struggle with the concept of money, especially budgeting. These are easy items for you to incorporate into your lessons or have your guest speakers incorporate into their presentations. Other ideas may be to do a hands-on lesson where students download their credit report. This can help them understand the importance of good credit and how it can impact their ability to rent an apartment, get car insurance, or even qualify for their dream job. Another great aspect of downloading their credit report is to review it for discrepancies. Sadly, we are seeing more and more students whose credit is damaged by family and friends who have wrongly used their identity to secure credit. Students need to learn how to protect themselves from identity theft. As we outlined on the PBS slide, you may even want to do a train the trainer event so that students know how to mentor other students when it comes to financial matters. We can even help with this training if you'd like to incorporate this suggestion. You may also want to create a book club. One option would be to have students read Chad Foster's Financial Literacy for Teens. This book is an easy read and is really designed for all ages because it covers topics such as needs versus wants, credit card debt, taxes, identity theft, and more. We recommend that you assign a chapter, and after the chapter is read, the students answer a series of questions that are relevant to the chapter, and then host a roundtable discussion. These roundtable discussions result in being peer counseling sessions, and students are able to share their life lessons with one another. Remember when we were talking about R&D earlier? Well, a little rip off and duplicate never hurt anyone. Here are a list of resources that you can draw or that you can easily hyperlink to from your own website. So I know that your attention was immediately drawn to Feed the Pig. You're probably wondering, what is that? The spokes pig, Benjamin Banks, is there to remind students to feed their piggy bank. This website includes fun tools, a quiz, tons of tips, and other resources. It also helps students think through their spending and saving habits. It helps them to identify ways they can start saving and commit to making changes that will reduce their debt and grow their savings. Specifically on this site, students can pick a personality that is similar to them, then they choose a set of spending habits that they want to change or break, and they can find out how much money they can save over a month, a year, or even 35 years. They can also sync the pig profile with their Facebook or iGoogle homepage, and then that way they can track right there through their Facebook how much they can save over time. There's also a way for them to link in to the 5% challenge. And this is so that they can monitor how much they can save no matter what course their life takes. They can also take a quiz to see how well they understand the psychology behind their saving and spending habits. I know I was talking to someone um, a couple of weeks ago and we were talking about when we don't feel, you know, like when we're sad or just like feeling kind of blah, the first thing we want to do is go shopping. And this quiz really kind of helps you understand the psychology behind that. Why do we shop when we're sad? And it helps them just kind of get a better idea of what their, you know, how their spending habits impact their overall life. There's also a way for them to give and get savings tips. And they can rate and comment on, e on each other in a friendly fashion, of course. So it's kind of good. It really is just a, a neat um, way for them to learn about financial habits without it really being you know, all peachy. Um, they can also access the resources section. And what that does is there's just a bunch more information there about savings. But it also links to Feed the Pig's companion site, which is 360 
financialliteracy.org, which has other information that's geared to people um, at all age brackets. We have a question about what was the book that I was referring to, and Jan's got it posted there, Chad Foster's Financial Literacy for Teens. That is a great book, and I know it has teens in the title, but to me it really is a great resource that appeals to all age brackets. Other resources that you may also want to share with your students are VITA programs in CGS Florida. VITA programs can assist students with free tax preparation, and CGS Florida is an offshoot of College Goal Sunday, and that's where students can get assistance with filing the free application for federal student aid. Jan and I are really excited because OSWA was chosen to host CGS Florida 2014, and what we're going to be doing is um, trying to partner with VITA so we can have tax prep and FAFSA completion all in one location. And we're going to be embedding the CGS Florida website into navigatingyourfuture.org. And that should be live probably within the next four weeks. Our plan is to host these events throughout the state of Florida in January or February and just be able to, to be there in the communities helping students find free money for college. If you're located outside of the state of Florida, you can check for College Goal Sunday within your own state by visiting College Goal, it's College Goal Sunday USA org. Again, that's College Goal Sunday USA org. But stay tuned for more information about what's going on here in Florida because we will be updating our website soon. The other thing um, that we're looking for is host sites for College Goal Sunday. So if you're interested in becoming a site, give Jan or I a call and we'll get some information out there about how to apply for a host site if you're interested in having that within your local organization. So another effective tool in reaching your students is to meet them where they are. I know our OSFA Outreach team has been successful in setting up resource tables at orientation events, in the cafeteria or break room, um, the local coffee shops, or even apartment complexes where students live. You may want to look into those avenues as well, and if we can help, just let us know. So let's take a second and talk about the logistics of setting up effective workshops or other events on campus. I know that you're thinking, how can I offer food and prizes? Trust me, we understand. Budgets are tight. But think outside the box. Talk to other community partners about helping you. For example, Papa John's is a strong education supporter, and they are really great about donating pizzas or providing them at a significant cost reduction. You may also want to check with other community partners. You know, maybe they would be able to give you gift cards or, you know, oh, maybe Massage Envy will throw in a, a free massage. You know, think outside the box. You know, talk to your community about, hey, you know, I want to host this financial literacy workshop on my campus. I really am trying to get our students to come in. Would it be possible, you know, maybe Starbucks will provide a coupon for free coffee, or maybe um, McDonald's will throw in some coupons for free ice cream cones. You just have to kind of use your networking skills and, and talk to your community about what they can do to help you. Once the event is scheduled, you just want to check and double check, you know, the room's reserved, we have everything is set up, the equipment's working properly, because you don't want to be stressed out at that last moment. Make sure your, you know, your evaluations, your handouts, all that's ready to go, because I know that, you know, when we go out and we're doing a presentation, if things aren't in a row, it does have a tendency to kind of stress you out and throw you off your game. So just make sure your ducks are in a row. That way when you're get, you, know, you get there and you're doing the workshop, you're going to have fun and you're going to, um, that's going to translate into the audience as well. So purpose-driven partnering. We want you to know we have this dedicated outreach team that is located throughout the entire state of Florida. For example, if you're in the South Dade area, um, you're going to be dealing with Isabel Acevedo. She lives and works in Miami, and she is there to help you. If you were in the Tampa area, you would be dealing with Stephanie Roche. She lives and works in the Tampa area. 
Um, if you're in the West Palm Beach area, you're going to be dealing with Robin Blank. Every outreach representative has an assigned region. So you know that you have this contact. You can pick up the phone and call and say, hey, Robin, I'm over here in um, Palm Beach County. I would love to set up a financial literacy workshop with you. How can we set it up? We want you to know that we are here. You're going to get a copy of, um, we're going to post a hyperlink in just a second so you can see our beautiful outreach map and it's all shaded and it shows if you're in this county, this is your representative. Um, because we want you to call us, we want you to email us because we know that we're here to support you and that you just need to pick up the phone and just let us know what we can do to make your jobs easier. We also partner um, with Mapping Your Future, and I'm not sure if you know what Mapping Your Future is, but it's at mappingyourfuture.org. And what we do is we sponsor Mapping Your Future for Florida students, families, and schools so that you can use all of their products and resources at no cost. That's what our sponsorship provides. Now, if you're outside the state of Florida, you may want to check with Mapping Your Future to see, are you in a state sponsor, are you in a sponsored state, or would you need to purchase your own membership? But for here in Florida, I encourage you that you need to look at mappingyourfuture.org and see what, you know, they've got stuff out there about career planning, um, scholarship searches, all kinds of great information about how to transition into higher education. Okay, we're going to, uh, I'm going to post the links right now. Uh, well, Jan's got the Navigating Your Future and then select Contact Us and go to the Outreach tab to find out where they're located. So you'll have that information. Um, Dan, you may also want to put up Mapping Your Future as well. Do we have any other questions before we end today's session? I'm going to post the link directly to that map that I was talking to you about as well, just so that you'll see the map. All right, do we have any other questions? Okay, before you leave today's session, we ask that you go out and complete the survey um, for today's webinar. And if you have any questions after the webinar ends, again, I want you to feel free to contact us. We would be more than happy to help you. Okay. Um, John has asked us to provide our contact information. Okay, that's my information, that's Jan's information, so if you have any questions or um, concerns, please let us know. There's our information as well. Okay. Well, if there's no other questions, um, thank you all for coming and joining us for today's webinar. Again, Jan and I thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules. Um, I just ask that um, you complete the survey and the PowerPoint will be sent out to you electronically if you haven't downloaded it yourself. All right. Thank you all for coming.